Welcome to Group Thinkers. I'm your host, Justin McCord. With me, as always, is Ronnie Richard. Uh, Group Thinkers is the podcast from RKD Group. And on each and every episode, we chat with someone in the space who's doing something innovative or different, thinking about and acting on things in a new way. And so today, our conversation mm -hmm. is with a uh, legendary podcaster and blogger, uh, more blogger, although he brings up uh, his podcast, Jeff Brooks of Future Fundraising Now. Ronnie, tell us a little bit about uh, Jeff. Jeff Brooks, he's, he's been serving the nonprofit community for more than 30 years. Um, he's done it as a copywriter and now as a consultant. Uh, he was named America's top fundraising writer by the legendary Tom Ahern. Uh, Jeff's worked at organizations large and small all across the world. Um, you'll hear him talk about some of his clients who are in Australia uh, in our conversation. Um, he's served uh, you know, all kinds of different charity sectors, um, international relief and health and hospitals and social services, faith-based, et cetera. Um, like you mentioned, you'll find him blogging and what he's very well known for, his blog, Future Fundraising Now. He also uh, contributes to the Motionic blogs, and he's also the author of three books, including The Fundraiser's Guide to Irresistible Communications. You know, it, it's uh, it would be too easy to say prolific, but I would say that Jeff is, at the outset of my time in this space, Jeff Brooks is one of the people that I was pointed towards to pay attention to, to, to read his content and uh, to study it and to, to, you know, pay attention to it. And so it's, uh, it's pretty neat, Ronnie, to get to chat with folks like that, that you're pointed towards. Um, a couple of things that, that stood out to me in the conversation for folks to be listening for is um, he, he gave, he kind of offered up these two tenants um, and we see this, you know, throughout these conversations that we're having, Ronnie, um, he, he offers up these two tenants of something that he learned early in his career that I don't think that he embodies today. I don't think that he realizes that he embodies it today. Um, and one was the, uh, the value in the pursuit of finding out what's real. Like the value in scientific testing and the value in direct response testing and finding out what works and why that's important. And then the second thing is that it's good to give away knowledge. And, and clearly we see that by uh, the work that he does on future fundraising now. And, you know, he talks a little bit about his uh, uh, fork in the road to where he almost went into academia. Um, but I, I can't help but liken him to... Uh, to someone that has the uh, the some of the tendencies of folks from antiquity of uh, of thinking and uh, improving and and the inherent value in both. Yeah, I mean he's the he's the philosopher in the public square sharing his knowledge. Um, yeah, those are great points. And and another thing that stood out to me was uh, he he said that a lot of times he likes to um, write about kind of like what's wrong with fundraising problems he sees in fundraising and he said the biggest one that stands out whether it's a large or a small organization kind of the same that it's this navel gazing of talking about themselves and hey we do all these wonderful things and we've been around for 30 years and everything and what they should be doing as we know is that they they should be talking to donors because donors want to make the world a better place and you need to speak to that in your fundraising um so yeah that that part really stood out so um for everybody uh, uh please enjoy our chat with jeff brooks ronnie i uh i'm sorry to tell you that again we have someone who is connected to proper football uh, so I noticed our, our guest, Jeff, Jeff, I noticed your Sydney Swans poster <laughs> hanging on the, the door behind uh, yes. you. Yes. Um, so now this is Australian rules football. Yes. The craziest sports event I've ever been to. <laughs> uh, what, yeah. So first of all, to, what were you doing in Sydney? And then what took you to uh, an Australian rules football game while you were there? 
<laughs> uh, I was in Sydney to attend some couple of conferences. I have uh, a lot of a lot of clients in Australia. Uh, this is before the pandemic, and I haven't been back since. But um, and um, uh, Sean, uh, a good friend down there, we, who we might talk about later, uh, said you've got to go to an Australian mm -hmm. rules football game. And I'm thinking, oh, it's soccer. <laughs> you know, no, it's not soccer. It is a completely different game. It's like a combination of foot, American football, rugby, soccer, and kids making up games as they go along. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it's really amazing. I did not know what was going on, but it was very interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, uh, I've caught Australian rules football on, uh, on TV or on even on YouTube from time to time, and and uh, it works in the context of this conversation because I feel like we're we're constantly our guests are constantly trying to enlighten Ronnie beyond LSU football, and so <laughs> yes, so open this, up this open up the world to me. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, welcome, Jeff. Welcome to to Group Thinkers. Thanks for for being a part of a, a chat with us today. We're excited to, to yeah. dig in to your journey. Great to be here. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, man, Jeff, it's so interesting, you know, having known of your work and read your work um, for some time, I, you know, I, I kind of want to start our conversation in 2005 uh, when you decided to start a blog. And, uh, and so, um, you still got it today, uh, in the, in future fundraising now, but like what, what prompted you in 2005 to start a blog and, and really the beyond just like the logistics of starting it, even today, the ideas and things that you're thinking about, I, I really want to get to what's your muse. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I think I, uh, at, at the time when I started in, in 05, there were no fundraising blocks. There were literally none. And there was like one or two that even touched on the nonprofit space at all. So I, you know, I saw a need. Now, when you start a blog, e even now, but back then when you start, like, there's no audience for it either. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and uh, so anyway, so I, I got it going. I, I, I just read other blogs and, and, you know, the blogs that were available then were very general interest kind of things, humor blogs, and, and there were sports blogs and things like that. Um, so it was unusual, I think, at that point yet to be that narrowly focused. But that's the promise of a blog, isn't it? That you can be about something really specific that serves uh, a, a small, a tiny audience, which is what our, you know, our space is. It's professionals in fundraising, which is not very many people. I mean, we, it feels like a whole universe to us, but it's yeah. it's tiny, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that's what I wanted to do. And I'll tell you the truth, the kind of the weird muse for me was then and is now when I see uh, bad fundraising. And I want to complain about it, but it would be churlish <laughs> to complain directly about it. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a way to say, I, I'm going to talk about this issue without rubbing somebody's face in it, <laughs> you know, um, and, and do it hopefully in a positive way that's helpful to, to other people. And then as the space has grown and now there are, um, I have, I follow 200 blogs and, and it's blocks. yeah they're not all fundraising but they're fundraising or fundraising adjacent yeah. um and so one of my the things i do a lot is i'll say hey here's a good post here's what they said and, and i try to add you know my own value to it yeah um that was not happening at first because there was no place to to do that <laughs> i think the next blog next fundraising blog that I became aware of was the agitator yeah. um, and uh, they they launched not long after I did and I discovered them because back then 
you get so little traffic that you actually look at your traffic every day and say, mm -hmm. look, another three people came, you know. <laughs> um, and there was there was one called it's called something at the agitator dot com. And, and you actually go and look and say, who is this? And they hadn't even launched, but they had gone kind of private live. And that's how I discovered them. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's so funny. It is to your point, And, you know, I think I, we see this when we uh, if I'm in any sort of a social setting and someone says, oh, Justin, what do you do? So, like, oh, well, I'm going to get to like, we're a horse of a different color, but let me tell you, first of all, about the horses and then the colors, and then let me tie together how small the space is, right? Even though we feel mm -hmm. like it's large. Yeah. Um, and it's fascinating to think about you and Roger, you know, being, um, you know, somewhat opposite coasts and still. Yeah. Similarly, um, uh, producing content that uh, was then and is still now very meaningful and mindful of of the things that that you see in the space, and you've been committed to it now. I mean, we're we're what in year eighteen? <laughs> yeah, who would have thought, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but 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 to go to go even further back, your career didn't start that way because you went to school, as we learned, uh, for for music. Your your degree was actually in music performance. So how in the world did you get from music performance to blogging about the fundraising space? Um, I don't know. Uh, um, I mean, <laughs> Yeah, that's actually a really common answer that people won't say. Yeah. They'll dwell around it, but I appreciate that you just jumped it. I don't know. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, how many people as a kid want to be a fundraiser? I, I mean, there must be people that have that, but boy, that seems like a weird kid to me. Um, I think a lot more kids want to be a musician, right? And that was me. And I, I uh, played, uh, you know, I did music throughout my childhood and, by the time I got into college, I was it was um, the obvious thing to major in. So I did, and it was sort of toward the end there when I was starting to think, do I really want this to be my job? Um, and I talked to a, a professional, a long-standing professional, who is a little bit skeptical and a little bit tired of his work, and he he told me, oh yeah, we play. Um, the 1812 Overture by Tchaikovsky. I don't know if you know this piece is very commonly performed piece. Yeah, we play it every year, sometimes three times a year. And I just thought, I don't want that. It's a great piece of music, but I don't, I don't want to play that that often. So I, you know, kind of cut bait. I freelanced for a while, um, but then started looking into other things. And I went to grad school in um, literature getting what I felt was going to be the academic track, the teaching track, and had a sort of a similar thing. I was, you know, on, on my way toward a degree, and I thought, do I really want to do this for the rest of my life? It's, you know, <laughs> it's really cool, uh, you know, talking about books and hanging around in libraries and writing about books, but the other 80% of what you do is not that. <laughs> I was starting to realize. So, I, you know, again, so I kind of had two starts of a career. Academia is the family business in my family. My father, my brother, and my son, and many other relatives are professors. <laughs> so it's, it was like kind of an obvious thing to do. Um, and, and then at that point, I just kind of randomly got a fundraising job, which I sort of thought of as a writing job. I didn't quite grasp what fundraising was. That's how it started, and it, it clicked with me, and I've, I've been there ever since. Jeff, what instrument did you play? Uh, I play string bass, which is the best instrument of, of, in the in the orchestra. It's also very flexible, and you can play a lot of different kinds of music as well that, that way. Do you still play? Yeah, I play in uh, uh, community orchestras here in Seattle. So I'm a happy amateur, and I only play uh, the 1812 Overture about once every five or six years. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, it's 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 interesting that you mentioned that your your family's in academia and they're all professors because in a sense, even though you got out of academia, you're kind of a professor for the fundraising industry in a way the, with your blog and the things that you share. Um, so I, I was looking again at your career a little bit. Um, you know, you after a couple of years, you you joined Domain Group where you spent a large portion of your career, 17 years, working your way up to become the creative director there. Uh, can you take us a little bit through kind of your time there and what you learned um, during these this part of your career? Yeah, well, the domain group is, you know, lamentably long gone now, um, but there are domain people all over the industry, including uh, a few of them at RKD, right? Sure. Um, yes. And, and it's kind of largely true that if you if you talk to um, a solid agency anywhere in the U.S. and in some other continents too, there will be domain group people there. <laughs> um, it was, you know, it was one of those magical places where some combination of vision and camaraderie and luck all kind of came together and because it, it was a special place where the philosophy was find out what's real that's what we just did and we did lots of testing we discovered a lot of things and if, you know the funny thing is we uh, when you test you start to find out that those boring old you know masters of old were right <laughs> you know basically you you can you confirm what um, they told you but you need to know and you also need to refine it and things change and you need to catch up with the way donors are. And that's what we did. And the other thing we did that was magical was we had a strong belief that uh, it's really good to give away knowledge. And I think that's probably why you have a blog and a podcast yourselves, right? Because um, you can't, uh, it, it's not effective to say, I've got the secret and I'm not gonna share it with anybody. And in fact, when I see people doing that, I kind of think, you know what? I think they're probably full of it. And I don't really trust them. Now, it might be that they actually have the goods and they know what they're doing, but they just have a bad philosophy. <laughs> but yeah, the more you give away, the more work comes to you. Um, because people, you know, uh, yeah, in theory, if I tell you how to do something, then you can do it yourself without paying me to do it. And probably that happens, but to a larger extent, people uh, respect you more and want even more. And I, you know, you're nodding because that's that's the way that's the way it works. Yeah. And the smart yeah, agency. Yeah, I mean, we're just that. completely tracking with you on um, God, even the phrase "special sauce" makes my right. eyes roll out of my head. It just doesn't right. like. Right. It doesn't, I, you know, I agree with you. I don't think that it exists. I think that it's the, um, it's the doing the work together, the collaboration, the creativity, the strategic thinking, um, plusing one another. And, uh, right. and, and you said, like, find out what's real and then uh, how good it is to give away knowledge. I think that those are, are um, apt and noble um, pursuits. And, uh, and so, yeah, Ronnie, it's funny that you, uh, that you draw out that connection of um, Professor Brooks here, because you are, I mean, you do, you do, you give away that knowledge, uh, you know, Jeff through, through your blog. And also obviously you, you, um, even if you're contracted with an organization, the, the way that you're consulting and the way that you're carrying yourself uh, helps you um, lean in, in a way that, that uh, gives away that knowledge. So, so uh, over the course of both those 17 years and then uh, and then your time since then, uh, yeah. uh, who are a couple of people to, that have um, spoken into your path and helped shape you um, to the way that you're uh, to the way that you carry yourself today? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I get so many people, right? I, and I could just sit here listing just amazing people I've worked with and and clients and, and co-workers. But I'll just pick out a few. Um, Tim Burgess, um, he has he's not in our industry anymore. 
he he was co-founder of the domain group and after he sold the domain group for which i wanted to throttle him and still sometimes would like to throttle him for that um, he went into politics and he was in fact mayor of seattle for a while <laughs> um, he, he was kind of just done with fundraising and he wanted to do something else but he kind of helped create that culture at the domain group that um, scientific approach and mm. kind of combining knowledge with passion um, and made some really smart hires and th you know things like that so i put him uh, on the list another person another domain person i would include is uh, john van wyck and i don't know if you've heard of him he was at domain kind of the whole time i was uh, he's an analytics guy and he um you at least know people at your shop who know him very well right right yeah um, and he uh, he's an uh, an analytics person that is like the opposite of what i am and we learned a lot from each other and we we've we've been good friends we still we still hang out and, and he lives in seattle here um and our, you know we and our wives go to the opera together it, you know it's been a great friendship but also a really good learning thing and being connected with him and then i guess finally i'll, I'll mention sean triner uh, in australia he's the founder of oceanic which is an amazing amazing organization that's all about helping people become better fundraisers he's he's also kind of of that mindset of think about what you know don't make stuff up don't do what you think you ought to do because of what you like uh he also founded a uh, pareto which is kind of like the domain group of australia and then he sold it <laughs> um and then founded uh, Mosianic. Jeff, earlier you were saying that one of the things that you like to write about a lot is see when you see a problem, uh, some fundraising that isn't, uh, you know, doesn't work for you, or you think it's just bad fundraising in general. Um, what are like today? What would you see as some of the problems that you see frequently, or things that maybe the industry as a whole just isn't doing right? Yeah, well, it's interesting. There, there's kind of several different wrong avenues that people tend to take. And, and by the way, sometimes that you, sometimes you'll, I'll write about something like that, and I'll hear back and say, "Well, we're doing this, and it's working." And so that can be a learning experience. Um, so sometimes you're wrong. <laughs> you know, you just because you know when you when you just say you look at a piece of fundraising and it seems wrong, you don't know it's wrong until you find out. Mm -hmm. For the most part, though, and you and you know this too, right? You just see just bad fundraising that just shouldn't be happening. I, I think there's one big thing is it's um, fundraising. It's all about how amazing we, the organization, are. That's probably the common denominator of all, and it's based on the sort of um, I call it fundraising from yourself, F F Y, <laughs> um, where you go, okay, what would make me want to give? Well, we've been around for 30 years and we have really awesome staff and our methodology, you know, and so you're just sort of thinking about what matters to you. And so you, you build that. Mm -hmm. um, super common, really common, even with very large professionalized organization, as you know, and, and you know, um, mm -hmm. they should know better. They've got all these, you know, well experienced, uh, educated professional fundraisers, and they still do that uh, because it's really hard to get outside of your own head um, now realistically something like 99 percent of all nonprofit organizations are very small organizations with you know 100 donors or you know up to 5,000 donors you know like really small too small for an you know a large agency to serve uh you can't the, the scale just doesn't work out right um and i kind of like to work with the small ones because I can, because I'm one person and they can afford me. Mm. Um, they kind of have a different problem, which is they just aren't connected to the knowledge base. And you'll see, it's, I, I almost swear there's a school out there that says, here's how you do direct mail. A one page letter with nine point type, a happy smiling face, 
um, it on and on about how amazing we are. The reply device is a bang tail envelope that the donor has to fill out. And I mean, it's so similar. These are the small, the ones I actually get in the mail, right? Yeah. Because it, it tend to be small local organizations. And, it, and it's where, do, where do you think that's why you do it? And it must just be, they do it because they see it and it feels good to do it that way. Um, so I, I, that's, the, that's the other one. It kind of is, those are both sort of two sides of the same coin. It's bragging about ourselves. It's about us, not about, well, you know, the reason donors give is to make the world a better place. They want to take action. They want to put their values into, it, it, you know, into the world. So you need to talk to them about that. And I think a lot of good donors, really good donors, actually translate your bad fundraising into that story for themselves. <laughs> right. Uh, Thank so goodness like, that they do. I mean, honestly, right. like, thank right. goodness that we have, that there's some kismet that can overcome yeah, right. the bad tendencies yeah. that, that you reference. Yeah. And so it works. But the thing is, it doesn't work like it ought to. And it's working worse all the time. Yeah. And as you know, the response rates have been dropping for something like 12 years in a row now. Uh, not in a row because during the pandemic, they went up. But it you know it's getting it's getting harder the costs are way up postage and printing everything's so in other words we used used to be kind of okay to do it that way yeah yeah um, but it's increasingly not okay yeah it's it's gone from in some ways um, not I I don't know if I would go as far as to say laziness although you could use that but it's it's like it was the easy way to cut corners to do like just a control based methodology and et cetera over right. time over time over time. Uh, and now it's, it begs the question of the rationale on even doing it that way, the way that we've always done it. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you hit on something that I think is really interesting. You know, we're having these, um, these conversations with a lot of folks just about leadership and, um, and the problem that you pointed out there for large organizations was a, a tendency to be self-focused first right fundraising for yourself right yeah. we probably will sit in many conference rooms where someone has given us feedback over creative that is a focus group of one <laughs> yeah. so it's, right. right right that sort of thing but then likewise what i heard you say from the small organizations is also from the focus group of one because it's the mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. the uh the executive director who you know, is only used to one way, their way, because they may not be exposed to a broader knowledge base. So it sounds like it's the same problem across the board of thinking about yourself first versus thinking about the person you're ultimately talking to. And I wonder what that, yeah. that tells us about, like, even just the state of leadership and what that means um, mm. as it relates to nonprofits and, and relationship with donors. Yeah, it, it it is that, and if you think about it, it's uh, you know that sort sort of not being able to get outside of your head. It's not that's not just a fundraising problem, right? That's a human relationship problem. And if you think about, you know, friendships you've lost, relationships that have broken, that's usually part of it. I can't get out of my head. I can't relate properly to this person because I can't think about what what they're in it for. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and if I, if I knew commercial marketing better, I'd probably be saying the same thing about it because, you know, you see ads and you get commercial direct mail that you're thinking, does this work? Yeah. And I don't know, I have no insight whether it works, but you know what, I right. bet they, there's just as much bad misdirected uh, navel gazing stuff in all kinds of marketing. Sure. That's yeah. just a guess, but I, it seems likely to be true. Yeah, it's no, almost, it really does. I was gonna say it's almost a, like as if they're they're so proud they joined the organization for the cause and they and they're working at the organization and they're so proud of it. So surely everyone else must be equally proud. But then, you know, when you put yourself in the donor's shoes, they may not really even know the organization that well, especially a new donor who's just coming into it. Yeah. Um, so 
yeah, it's 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 definitely very interesting. Yeah, yeah but Ronnie, it's it's funny, you know, you know, I could take this idea of of uh, navel gazing and even say that you know we we can see this at times uh, amongst our own peers and you know even reflect you know whenever we we think about like if we're prioritizing our perspective over that of the audience you know what what that means for us as leaders in whatever spheres and spaces and and certainly the impact that that has on trying to win someone to support you right yeah you're it doesn't even like the creative formative ideas of creative would tell you that that's not a a way to articulate persuasion by beating them over the head about your cv yeah well you know you probably experienced this too this is a um uh rf uh, RFP thing, <laughs> the, the the three most dreaded letters in the, in our in our business, and right. you as an agency, you you get into those, right? Sure. That um, they ask you a bunch of detailed questions, and then you basically come back with your ideas of what they ought to do, and you give them spec creative. Yeah. That's how that that's how you get new business in the yeah. you know in the agency world. And I'll tell you what, this has happened more times than I can count. That we would create um, spec creative that the prospective and then later client just loves and drooling over it. They're just, it's like a dream come true because what you're showing them is that we get you <laughs> and then we test it to donors and it's like the biggest failure ever. <laughs> so, you know, so much so that you, we know ahead of time, this isn't yeah. gonna work. Yeah. Now, it might be <laughs> that you have to do that kind of work because the audience at that stage is the person who's going to pay you. That is, you know, the people who work at the, at the organization. So you have to make them feel good. Yeah. I'm sorry, was I freezing there a little bit? You, no, you were good. visually. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, so it's, I mean, if you think about it, there's no surprise there, right? Hey, I aim solidly at the prospective client. I make them feel great it's irrelevant to their donors every time every time um and you, it's almost like you can't skip that step at least you know with a large organization um which is kind of one of the reasons i like small organizations is that you skip that step and you just you just have a, an adult conversation and you say you know we need to do it this way and this is going to feel weird to you uh you might really hate it it's quite possible that you're going to hate it, but we'll look at the results and see if it works. So it's, it's yeah. kind of like, you know, you don't have to do, let me do really terrible creative that makes you feel good first. So you'll give me the chance to do good creative that actually works for you. Yeah. How is that when you, when you have those conversations to explain that exactly like, Hey, what you've been doing over here, mm, not really what you need to be doing. And, and you and you kind of redirect in that way. How do those conversations go? Are they are they typically are people receptive to that, or are they a little standoffish, or a little bit of both, or what? I get some of each, um, and the ones who don't like what I'm saying, they don't hire me, and I'm glad they don't hire me because I don't want to work with them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, so in fact, my typical sort of sales funnel is. You know, somebody contacts me, we have a conversation, it kind of looks like maybe we could be working together. And then I do typically an audit of like their last year worth of fundraising. Mm -hmm. And I get really into detail and I look at their results and I look at their creative and, and I write them a document that says, here's what's going on. And predictably it's like, you know, they're doing a few things well and they're doing a few things not well. Mm -hmm. And I, I just tell them that. Sometimes they're upset by what I tell them. And so we part ways and that's fine. Other times they go, ah, I see. I understand what you're saying. Let's work together and let's fix this. And so in a way, that's kind of my little gatekeeping thing where I, you know, I, I don't want to work with people who don't want to actually take my expertise. Yeah. I want to work with I mean, people that who want. What that? that that is your product, right? So it's, yeah, right, it's a, right. It's a peculiar relationship whenever uh, whenever you have those engagements to where 
um, they're paying you uh, and then they don't like what you have to say. Like that, right. <laughs> that's not very right. high function, right? Right. Um, right. Well, Jeff, and, and I, I, I like to make it clear to them, be ready to feel uncomfortable, right? Yeah. Because that's a predictable side effect of all yeah. this. It's, it's, you're going to feel weird about this at times. When you uh, when you were talking about the the blog earlier, uh, and you know your original intent was to set out to have a, you know a place where you could talk about something that you were passionate about um, to be able to, as you said, you know give away some knowledge and and or an appropriate way to vent, right? To to talk about your observations, um, and so uh, I'm just curious as you think about it today, 18 years later, uh, how is that the same? How is that different? Um, what does that look like for you and your your stewardship of, uh, of that space even now? <laughs> it's, uh, what, well, what's really different for me now is doing a blog costs me money. Yeah, when you're in an an organization and you've got smart bosses, you can say, "Hey, could I carve out some of the time that you're paying me for to do this thing that we aren't going to build a clients?" Yeah. Okay. And, and you know, you might not win that argument. It took me a while to get them, you know, to get them to know what a blog is and why that would be good. But um, now I I'm the boss. And I'm the I'm the employee. I'm the whole thing, right? And if I want to do a blog, I have to spend time not doing paid work. And that's kind of scary. <laughs> it's, it's just, but but it, it's definitely worthwhile. I'm I, I'm pretty sure. I can't quite measure it. I mean, I can't do direct response and head testing. I mean, blogging versus not blogging. But <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it's pretty clear to me that it's it's important. And it's important not only, you know, it's like getting your name out there, saying things that are helpful to people. But blogging helps you organize your what you know. Hmm. You know, having to write something that you already know, you know it better after you do that. Hmm. And um, so basically anything that comes up, I have not only whatever work experience I have with that, but I probably also have, I wrote about it in a blog post um, experience. And in fact, I, um, I had a I had a podcast for several years with uh, Stephen Screen and I post old podcasts on my blog now and then. And that was in a way even better because you had to do it on your feet. We didn't script our, uh, you know, kind of like your podcast. We didn't script it. We just had a topic and we would talk it through. So it's yeah. almost like rehearsing for something. Somebody else is going to ask me this question someday and mm -hmm. I will have talked it through. Yeah. I love that. I love the, uh, just the idea of uh, the benefit of the exercise, but also uh, it's not just for you for now that right. there's some inherent future value to going through the process of putting your thoughts on paper. Yeah. Um, exactly. <laughs> honestly, it's something that I, I, I try to tell my, my uh, eighth grader and sixth grader, uh, and they look at me yeah. like, don't you know what a, a keyboard is? And why would I put anything down as opposed to, you know, try to improv my way through it? Um, yeah. But it is. I think that there's, yeah. there's right. this inherent value to the organizing of our thoughts. And I will tell you that it is uh, that, the the content that you continue to put out even now 18 years later um, still prompts discussion it prompts discussion inside our virtual walls as an organization uh, and i know between some of our clients and uh and the folks that are client facing on the front lines with them and uh i think that's a good thing I really do, and so oh, I, I was going to apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't say we always agree, <laughs> you know, right. but, but yeah. that's okay too, right? Like it's right. it's okay yeah. to yeah. have differences in in how you approach things or um, have seen maybe different things in in testing. Right. That's why I think there's beauty in the 
the art that uh, that we create as nonprofit fundraising uh, experts. Right. So, well, Jeff, we we uh, appreciate you lending your your time today and and talking through some of your journey. Um, and again, we just you know we want to uh, we want to see another eighteen years out of you, but we want to keep seeing. Uh, that content come across because it does uh, it provokes conversation and so you're you're definitely hitting the nail on the head there. Well, well, thank you. I, I appreciate hearing that. Yeah. Well, um, so thanks for being on the uh, on the episode. Just one last thing: uh, if folks want to connect with you, where uh, outside of you know just searching future fundraising now, where uh, where else can they find you? How can they get a hold of you? Yeah, well, that uh, the the blog, but futurefundraisingnow.com is that, that's kind of the, the main way to find me. I also have a sort of my own business website, which is www.jeff-brooks.com. I couldn't get just jeffbrooks.com, so there's a little hyphen between the first and the last name, and that just kind of has the here's who I am and here's my values and here are some of my clients. So that if, if that's of value to you. I also I blog also and and do coaching and so forth at mosianic.com. You can find me there and uh, perhaps work with me in some way there. So they, there's there's quite a few ways. Multiple different avenues, Jeff. Uh, keep uh, keep it up, man. Keep up the great work, and uh, and we appreciate you, sir. Thank you, and it's been, it's been really great talking to you.